Unit 1. Recording 2. And our next caller is Karen. Karen, what's your experience of public transport? Yes, hello, Gary. Well, I commuted to London for over ten years. I caught the train every morning at 7.15 to get to work for nine o'clock. And I wouldn't get home until about seven o'clock in the evening. And frankly, it was a terrible period of my life. Really stressful. Mainly because of the unreliability of the train service. I was forever arriving late for work. One day, I was travelling home when the train broke down and I eventually got back at midnight. Of course, I had to go to work the next day, so off I went for my 7.15 train. I'd been waiting over an hour when they announced that the train was cancelled. That really was the end for me. I arranged with my employer to work at home and I've been working at home happily for the last five years. Of course, it meant a big salary cut, but I haven't regretted it for a moment. Thanks for that, Karen. Can you just stay on the line? I'm hoping we've got Liam on the line. Liam, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Gary. Great. And what point do you want to make? Well, I just wanted to say that my experience is similar to your last caller. Although I'm a newcomer to commuting by public transport, I've just sold my car and now I go to work by bus. I'd owned a car ever since I left college, but I wanted to do my bit to cut down on pollution. But I have to confess that I'm regretting it already. I've arrived late for work twice this week because the bus hasn't turned up on time. It's got so bad that I'm now thinking of buying a motorbike. It'll cause less pollution than a car and be more reliable than public transport. Well, it sounds like you're another dissatisfied customer, Liam. But we've also got Sahar on the line, and I think she's more positive. Sahar, are you there? I am, Gary. Good afternoon. Hello, Sahar. What do you want to tell us? Well... I'd like to put in a good word for train travel. I'm working at home while our office block is being renovated, and while I'm appreciating being able to get up later than usual, I really miss my daily commute. You get to know the people you travel with every day. I remember one day I dropped my purse while I was getting off the train. Another passenger picked it up, found my address in it, and brought it round to my house later that evening. Another time, I'd been working really hard and went to sleep and missed my station. One of the other passengers was getting off at the next station and she had her car parked there. She woke me up and offered me a lift back to my home. I'd spoken to her only a couple of times before then, but now she's a really good friend. You meet a lot of nice people and become a part of the travelling community. Thanks, Saha. That's a side of commuting we don't often hear about. Now, somebody else who sees the good side of train journeys. Luca, are you there, Luca? Yes, indeed. Actually, I'm phoning from the train on my way home from work. And are you having a good journey? Yes, it's been fine. But then, I love trains. I've enjoyed travelling by train ever since I was young. I admit that it can be frustrating at times. There are delays and cancellations, and there are minor irritations like poor mobile phone reception. I've been trying to phone into your programme for the last half hour, in fact. But I catch the 7.05 at the station near my home every morning and still find there's something quite magical about stepping onto the train. And there are clear advantages over driving, apart from the lack of stress. I reckon that over the years I've saved a huge amount of money by using public transport. I've never really considered buying a car... You can also get a lot of work done. On the train yesterday morning, for example, I'd read a couple of reports and prepared for an important meeting before I even got to work. Admittedly, I'm quite lucky. The train company I travel with have invested a lot of money recently. They've bought new trains and have really improved the service. Gary? Karen, were you wanting to say something? Yes, I just wanted to pick up Luca's point that travelling by train is less stressful than driving. Public transport can be stressful too when trains don't turn up or are delayed. What's less stressful is working at home. At 8 o'clock I'm usually having a leisurely breakfast when most people are in their cars or on the train. Yesterday I'd finished all my work by 2.30 so I drove to the local pool for a swim. And today I've been working hard all day so now I've got time to relax by listening to the radio for a while. Much better than the stress of commuting. You're very lucky, Karen. We've got another caller on the line. Unit 2. Recording 3. You must be really looking forward to going to America. When are you actually leaving? I'm flying on the 15th of July. I'm spending a few days sightseeing in New York, and then I arrive in Los Angeles on the 20th. Lectures start on the 27th of July. Sounds great. And what about accommodation? 
Well, first I'm going to stay with Daniel and Susanna, some friends of my parents. You're not staying with them the whole time you're there, are you? No, I'll be looking for my own place, but I'm really pleased they'll be around. It'll be good to know I can contact them in case I have any problems. They're meeting me at the airport too. Mind you, I haven't seen them for years. They'll have forgotten what I look like. And what about the course? It looks really interesting. They sent me a reading list, but of course, I haven't got round to opening any of the books yet. So it's going to take a long time to catch up. I'll be studying really hard during the semesters so that I don't have to do much work in the vacations. And when does the first semester end? The 7th of December. Then I'm going to San Francisco for a week. I've always wanted to see the Golden Gate Bridge. I'm going to fly up there if it's not too expensive. Do you know when you'll be back in Los Angeles? Probably mid-December. So you can come any time after that. I'm so looking forward to it. I've always wanted to go to the States. I was going to see my aunt in Seattle a couple of years ago, but I cancelled the trip because she got ill. Will you stop over anywhere on the way out? Maybe New York or Chicago? I haven't really thought about it. But I've only got three weeks, so I think I'll fly directly to Los Angeles. Fine. And I'll meet you at the airport, of course. By the time you come, I'm sure I'll have got to know Ellie really well, so I'll be able to show you all the sights. Yes, I suppose you will. When I come to see you, you'll have been living in California for nearly six months. Hard to imagine, isn't it? <laughs> After Los Angeles, I thought we could go down to a place called Huntington Beach. If you bring your tent, we'll camp there for a few days. The weather will still be quite warm, even in the winter. Isn't it your birthday around then? That's right. I'll be 21 on the 2nd of January. Well, that'll be a really good way to celebrate. The best. I'll need to get back to Los Angeles for when the second semester starts. But you'll be staying longer, won't you? That's right. I don't have to be back in England until later. Well, why don't you go to the Grand Canyon? It's supposed to be spectacular. Yeah, I might think about that. Anyway, as soon as I book my tickets, I'll let you know. OK. We can sort out the details closer to the time. Fine. Look, it's nearly two o'clock. If I don't go now, I'm going to be late for my next lecture. I'll text you. Yeah. See you. Unit 3. Recording 4. And now on Radio Nation, it's 8.30 and here's a summary of the latest news. Air passengers could be hit badly today as cabin crews stay at home in the latest in a series of one-day strikes. The major airlines are warning that up to 100,000 people may experience delays. The managing director of Travel Air, David Wade, had this warning to the unions. I'm sure I don't need to spell out the chaos being caused in the airline industry as a result of these strikes, and I would like to apologise to all our customers. However, the cabin staff must accept the new working conditions if the airline is to compete, and the management has no choice but to stand firm on this issue. But he didn't have to wait long for a response. A union spokesperson said, I can't believe Mr Wade is being so confrontational. We will not be bullied by management. Eventually the airlines will have to return to the negotiating table. Up to 200 teachers and pupils had to be evacuated from Northfield Primary School in South Wales today after a fire broke out in an adjacent building. Although firefighters were able to bring the fire under control fairly quickly, they couldn't prevent the fire damaging the school's sports centre. The head teacher said it might be a number of months before the sports centre is back in operation, although the school itself should be able to reopen early next week. The new Borland Bridge, connecting the island to the mainland, was officially opened today by the Transport Minister. However, it's been in operation for a few weeks already and has received a mixed reception from islanders. From Borland, here's our reporter, Anna Curtis. Yes, the new bridge has stirred up a lot of strong emotion on Borland and I'm here to gather the views of some of the island's residents. Excuse me, what do you think of the new bridge? I think it will be of great benefit to the island. We used to be terribly isolated here because the ferry service was so bad. It's only a short distance but the crossing would take over an hour at least. It could be a very rough journey too. Many passengers would get seasick during the crossing. Excuse me, I'm asking people about the effects of the new bridge. They reckon that tourism on the island is set to expand. 
Is that such a good thing? There are already far too many cars and people. We'll also get wealthy people from the mainland who can afford second homes. That will push up house prices, and islanders won't be able to buy properties. That can't be right, surely. There ought to be restrictions on the number of people moving here. It's certainly true that the bridge is going to have a major impact on the way of life of the people here over the next few years. But whether that will be a positive or negative effect, only time will tell. Following her report on the high levels of obesity among children, the government's chief health advisor, Professor Carmen Brady, has said that schools have to play a more active role in encouraging children to take up sports. She has also criticised parents. Parents needn't be very interested in sport themselves, but they should give their children whatever encouragement they can. While we were gathering information for our report, we found that some parents will actually discourage their children from taking up a sport on the basis that they might get distracted from their academic studies. This negative attitude to sport mustn't be allowed to continue, not if we are to get on top of the obesity crisis facing the country. And finally, the weather. Well, if you're in the south of the country, you shouldn't be troubled by any rain today. It will be warm, sunny and dry, with temperatures up to 22 degrees Celsius. However, in the north, you're likely to see an occasional shower with maximum temperatures of around 15 degrees. Radio Nation News... Unit 3. Recording 5. Exam Practice. Listening, Part 1. You will hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1. You hear two people on a radio programme discussing music education for children. Research shows that the optimum time to start music education is between the ages of three and four. As well as improving manual dexterity and concentration, it seems that it may help emotional development too. And starting young on understanding musical notation lays down an excellent foundation for later on. The piano is the instrument that many parents want their children to start learning, and I think three years old is the right time to start. Starting early is vital, but less demanding instruments would be my choice. Things like the recorder or a half-size guitar. Personally, I don't think the piano is the best instrument to start with so early. Children have to show the mental, physical and emotional readiness to learn an instrument like the piano, which obviously takes a lot of effort and commitment. In my experience, very few children under six are able to take on that kind of challenge. Well, I think children of that age can learn to play simple tunes on the piano and they soon progress to more complicated pieces if they can read music. But a rather academic approach will turn children off for life if they're not ready for it. Enjoyment has got to be the priority. Well, enjoyment is certainly important, but if you... Research shows that the optimum time to start music education is between the ages of three and four. As well as improving manual dexterity and concentration, it seems that it may help emotional development too. And starting young on understanding musical notation lays down an excellent foundation for later on. The piano is the instrument that many parents want their children to start learning, and I think three years old is the right time to start. Starting early is vital, but less demanding instruments would be my choice. Things like the recorder or a half-size guitar. Personally, I don't think the piano is the best instrument to start with so early. Children have to show the mental, physical and emotional readiness to learn an instrument like the piano, which obviously takes a lot of effort and commitment. In my experience, very few children under six are able to take on that kind of challenge. Well, I think children of that age can learn to play simple tunes on the piano and they soon progress to more complicated pieces if they can read music. But a rather academic approach will turn children off for life if they're not ready for it. Enjoyment has got to be the priority. Well, enjoyment is certainly important, but if you... Extract 2 you hear part of an interview with a rock climber called Ben. So, Ben, you're well known in the climbing world as a bit of a loner. You prefer climbing without other people. Is that true? Well, to some extent. I've always talked to other climbers about the technical side of things, training, equipment and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've got to learn independently through trial and error. 
If you're climbing in a group, you'll always compare yourself to others, and that doesn't always help you to improve. It's good to admire other climbers, but different things work best for different people. So you never climb with other people? As far as possible, I climb alone, but occasionally I look to others for support. When I was younger, I used to do most of my climbing during the summer holidays, and I haven't done much winter climbing, so I still feel out of my depth climbing alone on rock faces covered in ice. When it's dangerous like that, you need people who've been brought up with it. It's good to have people around to advise you on what's a safe manoeuvre to make in the circumstances. So, Ben, you're well known in the climbing world as a bit of a loner. You prefer climbing without other people. Is that true? Well, to some extent. I've always talked to other climbers about the technical side of things, training, equipment and things like that. But at the end of the day, you've got to learn independently through trial and error. If you're climbing in a group, you'll always compare yourself to others and that doesn't always help you to improve. It's good to admire other climbers, but different things work best for different people. So you never climb with other people? As far as possible, I climb alone, but occasionally I look to others for support. When I was younger, I used to do most of my climbing during the summer holidays, and I haven't done much winter climbing, so I still feel out of my depth climbing alone on rock faces covered in ice. When it's dangerous like that, you need people who've been brought up with it. It's good to have people around to advise you on what's a safe manoeuvre to make in the circumstances. Extract 3. You hear part of an interview with a restaurant critic called Amanda Downing. You're such a household name, it must be terrifying for staff when you go into a restaurant. How do they react? It's true that a lot of people know me, at least in the restaurant world, so I always eat with a friend and they'll make the booking. Often, though, I get recognised, and when that happens, it's inevitable, I suppose, that they take a bit more care over serving the food, and some seem a bit nervous. I've never been given a complimentary meal, though, or anything like that. That would be just too obvious, and of course it could be considered unethical to accept a gift like that. Mm. And what makes a good restaurant? A good restaurant is one where the management and waiting staff have given some thought to why their customers are there. Most restaurant owners believe that the main reason people go to restaurants is for the food, but that's completely wrong. The main reason people go to restaurants is to have a good time, not because they're hungry. So there might be a big difference between the priorities of a restaurant and the priorities of diners. For example, one thing that a restaurant gets judged on is the quality of service – what restaurant owners think is good is service that is efficient, but what customers have as their priority is friendly service. You're such a household name, it must be terrifying for staff when you go into a restaurant. How do they react? It's true that a lot of people know me, at least in the restaurant world, so I always eat with a friend and they'll make the booking. Often, though, I get recognised, and when that happens, it's inevitable, I suppose, that they take a bit more care over serving the food, and some seem a bit nervous. I've never been given a complimentary meal, though, or anything like that. That would be just too obvious, and of course it could be considered unethical to accept a gift like that. Mm. And what makes a good restaurant? A good restaurant is one where the management and waiting staff have given some thought to why their customers are there. Most restaurant owners believe that the main reason people go to restaurants is for the food, but that's completely wrong. The main reason people go to restaurants is to have a good time, not because they're hungry. So there might be a big difference between the priorities of a restaurant and the priorities of diners. For example, one thing that a restaurant gets judged on is the quality of service – what restaurant owners think is good is service that is efficient, but what customers have as their priority is friendly service. Unit 4. Recording 6. So how on earth did they manage to get in? There's no sign of a forced entry. Well, I suppose they could have got in through a window up on the fourth floor. But no one would have dared climb up the outside of the building. Anybody trying to do that would have been seen from the street below. You don't think they would have been able to jump from the block across the road, do you? No, it's much too far. 
Of course, there's always a fire escape around the back of the building. They could have climbed up there reasonably easily. And after that, they might have been lowered by a rope from the roof. If that was the case, people living in the block of flats behind the museum might have seen something. So we need to talk to them. Right. But we needn't interview everyone in the block, just the people who have windows facing the museum. I'll arrange that. If it wasn't a window, the only other possibility is that they went in through the front door. Perhaps they forced a lock. But the door didn't appear to be damaged at all. And the entry code is supposed to be known only by the security guard. So someone else must have opened the door from the inside. Only the security guard was allowed to stay in the museum after it closed. Do you think they somehow persuaded him to let them in? Maybe they just knocked on the front door and he opened it. He surely wouldn't have done something as stupid as that. Do you think he might have been expecting them and that he was part of the gang? But then why would they have attacked him? I don't know. But we better find out all we can about that guard as soon as possible. Now, who was it that raised the alarm? It was the head cleaner who went into the building early this morning. He must have to know the entry code too. Yes, maybe. He says the front door was unlocked when he got here, but he claims he didn't see anything else unusual until he got to the fourth floor. But of course, he might be lying. Yes, he must know that he ought to have called the police as soon as he found the door open. I wonder why he didn't. I think we should talk to him again. I suppose he could be hiding some information from us, and he might be prepared to tell us more if we put a bit of pressure on him. The other puzzling thing is how they took the paintings away. Apparently they're very big, so the robbers must have had to bring a van around to the front of the building. The driver must have been waiting nearby and drove up when they'd got the paintings. They could have loaded the paintings up very quickly and might have driven straight to a port or airport. Anyway, the forensic team should have finished examining the building by now. Once they've done that, I think we should go and look around for ourselves. Unit 5. Recording 7. Right. Perhaps you could tell me something about how you got interested in environmental science and what experience you have in the subject. Well, I've always been fascinated by plants and animals, and then last year a friend of mine, Mike Proctor, invited me to Brazil. He's the head of a project there run by a European charity. The charity's aim is to help groups of villagers set up their own schools and medical centres. They also encourage sustainable agriculture and the setting up of businesses to sell local handicrafts. Anyway, it was during my stay that I really began to understand the impact of climate change. I want to learn more about this and, more generally, how decision-making on environmental issues in one part of the world can affect the lives of individuals elsewhere. You say you began to understand the impact of climate change. Could you give me an example of what you saw in Brazil that influenced you? Yes, of course. We've all heard about the destruction of the rainforest, and I was able to see examples of that. But also, people don't realise that the climate in the region is changing and that the speed of change is frightening. There's been a drought there for a number of months, and river levels are low. I had direct experience of this when I travelled with Mike. Having responsibility for the whole project in the area means that his job involves travelling to some pretty remote areas. Sometimes we had to go by boat to get to some of the villages, and we had to carry the boat because there wasn't enough water in the river. And is this change affecting the lives of local people? A huge amount. The main problem has been the effect of the drought on food supplies. The majority of people there are farmers, and all of them have lost animals and crops. The charity's project has been a success so far in that levels of income from the sale of handicrafts have increased. But, of course, financial success isn't everything. It's hard to imagine a future without farming in an area like that. Your trip to Brazil sounds like an amazing experience. And since you've been back, have you done anything to develop your interest in the area? Yes, I've read a book about energy conservation and how this might slow down climate change. And I was particularly interested in how the Netherlands has begun to tackle the problem. The government has introduced some really interesting projects on energy saving in cities, the use of low energy light bulbs to reduce the consumption of lighting energy, better insulation for homes and things like that. There's also a massive recycling scheme, which is saving an enormous amount of waste. What's needed now, though, is to expand work like this across the world. 
Mm. And what are your plans for the future? What do you want to do after you've left college? Actually, I'd like to go into politics. We've got, somehow, to persuade governments in developed countries to change their priorities. For example, even if just a small percentage of the money spent on the arms trade could go into tackling climate change, I'm sure we could make a difference. And you think that as a politician, you'd be able to do this? <laughs> I'd certainly like to try. Before we finish, have you got any questions about the course here at the college? Mm. I've noticed that statistics is included in the course. I'm a bit concerned about that. I wouldn't worry about it. You'd be able to get by with a reasonable knowledge of maths. Oh, that's very reassuring. I also wanted to ask about the field trip for second-year students. OK. Second-year students go to Nepal in June, looking at the ecology of mountain environments. Oh, that sounds like a fantastic opportunity. Unit 6. Recording 8. Speaker 1. I took up running a couple of years ago. Until then, I did a bit of sport at school, but I didn't do much outside school at all. In fact, I suppose I didn't have many interests, except playing computer games. Then I went to watch my uncle in a 5k fun run. It was to raise money for charity. I thought the whole event was brilliant, and every runner there seemed to be enjoying it. There was another fun run later in the year, and I signed up for a laugh. I didn't do any proper training for it, just a bit of jogging around the park after school. So I was really surprised when I managed to run all the way. Now I run nearly every day, and I get a lot of satisfaction out of it. My friends all think I'm crazy. None of them like the thought of running long distances. I think about all kinds of stuff when I'm running, and I know it's really good for my heart and lungs. Sure, some people get running injuries, but I've been lucky I've had none so far. Speaker 2 I'd never really thought about exercise and keeping fit until a couple of years ago. My boyfriend and I were in town late and we had to run to catch the last bus home, just a couple of hundred metres. By the time we got to the bus stop, both of us were completely exhausted. On the way home, we started talking. Neither of us did any exercise and I didn't do much with my free time, just reading magazines and eating biscuits. By the time we got home, we'd each decided to take up a different activity for six months and see who could lose the most weight. My boyfriend joined a gym and I started running in the local park, just a few hundred metres at first and gradually building up. Now I run a few kilometres each day. Of course, that takes up quite a lot of time and my boyfriend moans about that sometimes. But after I've been sitting at my computer all day, I can't wait to go out for a run. We've certainly both got a lot fitter and I've lost a lot of weight. Not all the effects are positive, of course. I've had a few problems with sore knees and sprained ankles. I suppose all exercise carries some risks. But there isn't much evidence that running causes major problems if you warm up carefully and have good footwear. It's one of the few sports where no special equipment's needed. Just a pair of running shoes. Speaker 3 I had three older brothers, and I think they could all have been Olympic athletes if they'd had the opportunity. So it was quite natural that I would go out running with them. I think I started at about the age of ten, and I've been running regularly all my life. Now that I'm getting older, I go out running every couple of days, but if the weather's bad, I might go all week without a run. I certainly go out a lot less during the winter. Well... Who would want to go running on a horrible rainy day? Inevitably, you get a few injuries, too. Everyone gets aching muscles after a long run, and I used to get back pain occasionally. But surprisingly, I seem to have fewer injuries now than when I was younger. Maybe it's because I run more slowly. Actually, I feel a lot healthier, and I even sleep a little better after I've been out running. But I think the best thing for me is the social contact. We've got a running club in our village. Uh, I moved here when I retired. And before I joined the club, I had very few friends who lived nearby. Now, many of my closest friends are the runners in the club. Next spring, we're all going to Madrid to run in a marathon for over 60s only. Of course, we know that not all of us will finish, but you can be sure that every one of us will have a really good time. My aim is to complete the course and do it in less than six hours. <laughs> but I know it won't be easy. Unit 6, Recording 9, Exam Practice, Listening, Part 2. 
you will hear a woman called Janet Naylor talking about her experience as a volunteer in Tanzania. For questions 1 to 8, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. Earlier this year, I fulfilled a lifelong ambition of mine by working for three months as a volunteer in an African country. I'm in my late 50s now, and I don't have the commitments that have previously held me back, like bringing up small children. I've worked in marketing for much of my life, and I wanted to use the skills I have to help out in a small way. I applied to do voluntary work a couple of years ago, but it wasn't until about a year later that a suitable scheme came up and I was asked to go. The reaction of my friends to the news was very interesting. The majority of them told me how impressed they were, and a lot said that given the opportunity, they'd like to do something similar – although I must say that some of them were not so keen when I told them later about how basic the conditions were. But a few clearly disapproved of what I was doing. They argued that I was patronising Africans by intervening and telling them how to run their lives. But I saw it rather differently. It's true that in an ideal world, development schemes should be set up by the communities themselves that they're going to benefit – but sometimes local people don't yet have the necessary skills to make them effective and need some kind of outside expert support, such as international agencies. And that's where I came in. I was an advisor to a scheme based in a village of about 200 people in Tanzania. It involved building concrete tanks to capture water during the wet season with the aim of reducing the problem of drought during the rest of the year. With better irrigation would come more reliable crops so that the villagers wouldn't be so dependent on international aid. The problems there were getting really serious. There had hardly been any rain in the area for the previous three or four years. The whole region was on the brink of starvation and handouts from charities were the only thing that kept people alive. The scheme had been underway for less than a year when I arrived and my brief was to suggest ways in which the villagers could market any agricultural production that was surplus to their own requirements, any food that they didn't need themselves. I've heard now that the village is making money from its crops by selling them in other parts of Tanzania and even exporting some produce, and it's built a primary school and a small health centre. It's very gratifying to know that the scheme has completely transformed its prospects, and the village is now well on its way to becoming a thriving community. Now listen to part two again. Unit seven, recording ten. In the studio today, we have the novelist David Bardrath, whose most recent book, A Woman Alone, was published last week. Welcome to the programme, David. Well, thanks for inviting me. Now, David, you came relatively late to writing, didn't you? Well, I suppose I'd always been a writer, poems, short stories and so on, but only my close family had read anything I'd written until I had my first novel published in my early 40s. And how did you feel about that? Oh, it felt fantastic having my first book published. At that time, you were a primary school teacher in your native Scotland. At what stage did you leave teaching? Until my third novel was published, I was happy to teach during the day and write in the evening and at weekends, but I found that there wasn't enough time to do both as well as I wanted to, so I left teaching and I started writing professionally. Some of my close friends thought I was mad to give up my job and I was greatly relieved that my subsequent book sold quite well. So no regrets about leaving teaching? Oh, it was the most difficult decision imaginable. I'd worked at the same school for about 15 years and I felt bad leaving the children and also some very close colleagues and friends, but I still live near the school and I go back on every possible occasion. Tell us something about the process of your writing. How carefully do you outline the story at the very beginning? Before I start writing, I always know how a book is going to end, although I rarely have a clear idea at the beginning of how the characters will develop. As I write, gradually they grow into real people in my own mind, but sometimes even I'm surprised at how they turn out. And what about your daily work routine? I suppose I'm fairly disciplined in my writing. I'm generally up at about seven in the morning, and I usually start work by about eight o'clock. I work upstairs. We've converted our attic into a study. In the early stages of a new book, I'll often go to the city library in the afternoon to do some research. You don't use the internet. As a rule, I prefer finding information from books, and I only turn to the internet as a last resort. Let's go on now to your latest novel, A Woman Alone. I was surprised to find it set in Norway. Yes, I finished my previous book last January, 
I'd been feeling really tired, and I was aware that I needed rest and a source of fresh ideas. I taught English in Sweden after I left university, and I still speak Swedish quite well, but I hadn't been to Norway before. There are a lot of historical links between Norway and the north of Scotland, so I decided to spend some weeks there. Some of the geographical settings used in A Woman Alone are based on places I visited while I was travelling around. And A Woman Alone seems to be more personal than many of your other works. I'd already decided that I wanted to write about a single parent family. Uh, as you may know, my sister and I were brought up by my mother on her own. Uh, the mother in the story, Elsa, is very protective of her children, as was my own mother, but although they have certain common characteristics, Elsa is not really modelled on my mother. Elsa is quite a dominant figure and a woman susceptible to periods of depression, whereas my mother was a rather gentle woman and always calm. And when you're researching and writing books, do you have time to read other people's novels? I do, yes. One novelist I greatly admire is William Boyd. He writes simply but with great control of language. I've just finished his excellent novel, Restless. It's a quite remarkable story. I'll certainly add that to my list of books to read. <laughs> And what about your present writing project? What are you working on now? Well, I don't know if I can tell you yet. I'm still sketching out the plot, so it's very much in the early stages. I know there'll be a lot of people waiting eagerly to get hold of it. David Bardruth, thank you for talking to us. My pleasure.